Good morning. I'm Father Ryan Humphreys, and I'm very happy to be here with COVID Catechism Part 3 of the Book of Revelation. This one has been a little challenging. It's been delayed three separate times. I don't know whether that's the Holy Spirit or what's going on, but it has been a bit of an adventure getting this to you, and so I'm very, very happy to be able to do it. Finally, this is Talk 3, which is on the end time. And so this whole presentation really does try to dig into what do we know about heaven? What do we know about hell? What do we know about the end of days? Specifically, what does the book of Revelation have to say about heaven, hell, and the end of days? Now, I want to make just a, a, a big disclaimer up front. The whole matter of Armageddon, the day of the Lord, as it's, as it's thought of in the Old Testament, uh, the rapture, these are all things that are dramatically overemphasized in the book of Revelation. These are not the purpose of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is not given to us and was not given to St. John on the Isle of Patmos as some kind of, of decoder ring about the future. It was not given to us as a way of discerning the future or of divining the future. It was not given to us as some kind of, of uh, panic material, nor was it given to us as a user guide for how to survive the last days. Uh, it's really not intended to be any of those things. The book of Revelation is very much given to us as this vision for the early church and for all of us about heaven and about salvation and about eternal life and about the whole reality that we're going to have day in and day out of this, this spiritual battle that is going to take place within my heart, within my family, within my community, within the church at large, and then within the world at large. That's why we have the book of Revelation. And so while all these different symbols are good and valuable, they are not some kind of secret code, you know, some kind of Da Vinci Code-esque thing that when we finally figure it all out, we will have the magic cure for whatever the case may be. That's not what the Lord gave it to us for. And so it's important in our minds that we remove the book of Revelation from the church as drama queen uh, list and say this is the church, this is not the church as drama queen, this is not the Holy Spirit giving us the decoder ring at the bottom of the Apple Jacks box. This is a book about the spiritual life that does have implications for the larger church and for the larger world, but not the kind of implications that folks who are peddling panic with talk about the rapture or the end of days. So this talk is about that topic, but it's as much about heaven as it is about the end of the world because the book of Revelation is as much about heaven as it is at the end of the world. So just kind of keeping that in mind, um, we want to just kind of make sure we remember that no one knows the day or hour. There is not a secret decoder ring, and it is a heresy to believe that we can decode the Bible in order to divine the future from some secret message that God has woven into it. That's not what we believe now, and it's not what we've ever believed. Uh, it's also important that we kind of keep this in mind because the end that really matters when it comes right down to it, is not the end of the world. There's a relatively small number of people who will experience the end of the world when, it, when Jesus actually comes to walk on earth again and do his thing. There are a handful of people who will be alive, but most of us, for most of us, the end that matters is my own end. It is my death and my going to meet the Lord that is the end that we are really going to care about. That's the one we're working toward. That's the one the vast majority of our spiritual life should be oriented to. Uh, also, one final note, and it's worth thinking about, why do we ask and why do we need to know about heaven or hell or purgatory or what happens after death or the end of days or what happened? Why do we need to know about any of those things? And part of the answer is this natural human fear that we just kind of don't like to know or don't like not to know. You know, there's this fear of the unknown. And I say, well, I, I don't, if I'm going to die, I'd like to know a little bit about it, please. The same way I say if I've got to go in and take a test, I'd like to know a little bit about that. Or if I've got to go meet my new bishop, I'd like to know a little about him before I walk in the room. There is a genuine human fear of the unknown. But even above and beyond that, there is this kind of obsessive need in the culture in which we live to sensationalize things. 
us. And so there's this kind of notion that we actually need to know what the book of Revelation says so that we can choose not to buy into the lunacy and nonsense that is uh, the rapture or the left behind or any of the other nonsensical ideas that have been so built up by the film industry on one hand and by profiteering Christians on the other uh, that, that, that allows us to kind of say, if I know what the book actually says, then I can freely set aside the lunacy and nonsense. I have a friend who may end up watching this who called and said, look, there are some Catholics around me talking about the three days of darkness, you know, in this prophetic sort of thing. And, you know, do I need to go buy beeswax candles? Because at the three days of darkness, the only light that will actually show won't be electric light you'll have. And, and and, and, you know, this is, this is a, a, a well-educated, thoughtful Christian, but it's so easy to get caught up in a, a, a kind of panicky sort of mentality. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for us to think more deeply about the book of Revelation on purpose and deliberately so that we know what not to think. And so, that being said, all those things reminding, the end being unknowable, it's created the, to be unknowable by God, and so aware of all that stuff, let's dive in then to what we know about the book, what the book of Revelation has to tell us about heaven, about hell, and about the end of days. Okay, so let's start with heaven, and we're going to turn straight to chapter 4. Now remember last week, we looked at chapters 2 and 3, which was all those messages to the angels. Chapter 1 is really kind of setting us up. It's, you know, I, I John, went to the Isle of Patmos, went into a cave. So chapter 1 was just the intro. Chapter 2 and 3, these books of the angels giving their messages to various churches at Pergamum and so on and so forth. Chapter 4 uh, begins with these verses. And again, I'm using the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Uh, if you want to look along with me, you can use your own version. I like the RSV, not the NRSV, but the RSV. Uh, it's just my favorite translation. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. After this, I looked and lo, in heaven an open door. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and lo, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there appeared like jasper and carnelian, and round the throne was a rainbow that looked like an emerald. Round the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clad in white garments, with golden crowns upon their heads." From the throne issued flashes of lightning and voices and peals of thunder. And before the throne burned seven, and, seven torches of fire, where the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there, was as it, there is, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And round the throne, on each side of the throne, there are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all round and within, and day and night they never cease to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, singing, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you did create all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And so, heaven comes to us as a dazzling, worshipful experience, a place of overwhelming beauty, that's where we, we get Jasper Carnelian, a place of glimmering, shining beauty. Notice the mention of a rainbow, which is a sign of the first covenant between God and the Jewish people. This is a reminder that God keeps his promises. We also have 24 thrones. We have 12 for the, the tr tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Israel, of, of uh, Jacob. 
and we have 12 for the apostles. 11, of course, the apostles we know, plus St. Matthias, uh, who is, whose feast is actually coming up when I'm making this presentation. And so we have here this reminder that the Old Testament is not washed away, that it wasn't accidental, that it has not been replaced by the new, but that the new complements, mirrors, and images it. Uh, heaven is, and at the end of the day, all of these things point out, remember we should say the four living creatures, the image of the gospel covered with eyes back and forth in the image of the seraphim with their six wings. We have, you know, these, these various images of casting crowns down, again, attached to the kingly role of the 12 brothers in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles in the New. But the thing that stands out most profoundly is that heaven is not about you or me. It's not about long talks with Grandma or Grandpa Joe. It's not about indulging all the things I dutifully avoided in my life. It's not about some Buddhist notion of, of just kind of a nirvana. It is not like the Jehovah's Witness would argue, that it's just some kind of place of perfect peace or calm or tranquility. Heaven is about nearness to the throne of God. That's what happens there. That's what everybody is there for, to be near to the throne of God. It's about the fullness of what it means to be human, to be created in the image and likeness of God, and therefore to desire to be near to God, to be near to His love. It's what St. Thomas Aquinas called the beatific vision. And what we see here immediately after we get the introductory material, the book of Revelation says this is what heaven is. It is worshiping the Lamb. It's worth noting that heaven, it would seem, is less of a physical place and more something that could be contained by this creation. It's more of something that we might call super or supra-physical. It's beyond physical the way that we understand physicality um, in, a, in a place that has real bodies, in a place that has a real physical component. And so that physical component, though, exists in a way that does not make sense and is not comprehensible to us because the bodies don't have to follow rules like our bodies do. You know, I can't be made of all eyes and have six wings and be simultaneously on the ground and floating above it. That, that's not possible in my comprehension of physicality because there are rules in which blood has to flow from here to there and therefore I need to have certain body parts here and certain body parts there. Heaven doesn't obey any of those rules. And so it is not physical in some ways, and it is physical in others. That's why we can call it super physical or supra physical, if you prefer, to be very, very specific. After all, we know this because Jesus, when he walked among us, was obviously very physical. And with the exception of the miracles, with the exception of the walking on the water and the multiplication of the loaves, Jesus followed the rules of the world. Um, we also, you know, know that he, even the miracles he conducted, he did in such a way that were within the reasonable expectations of the world. If that guy was sick and he restored um, his sight to him or restored him his health, it's not like he added an eyeball in the middle of his head or he caused him to float off the ground. That's not, he didn't generally break the rules. He simply massaged it back to way the way it should be. But once Jesus dies and rises again, all bets are off. Now Jesus can be wherever he wants to be. He can walk through walls. He can be recognized or not recognized. And so we start to get a sense that this is something that Jesus was setting up for us and showing us that heaven would be like this even as he was among us before we got to his ascension. And so as soon as Jesus dies from the dead, all the laws of nature kind of go away and he gets to do kind of his own thing. Now, at the same time that we know this, we know that heaven has a physical component. We get this very clear sense that the crowns that are these, these beings are wearing, and that they're sitting on thrones, the crowns are falling to the ground. We get the sense that, that these things have bodies. They have physical manifestations. And so it is not merely possible to say it's perfectly spiritual, nor is it possible to say that the physical follows the rules that we experience. And that's something that chapter 4, I think is going out of its way to show us the connection to the Old Testament, the physicality, and yet at the same time, physicality by an entirely different set of rules, and the fact that at the center of everything is the altar with the Lamb. 
Now let's flip ahead, and I'm not going to read the entire book of Revelation, we'd be here all week, but let's flip ahead to Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, and it says this, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Okay, so now we're getting something a little bit tighter. We're focusing in on the lamb. We've looked at what's going on around. We got the wide shot. Now we're going to zoom in and we see this focus where second to the throne is the altar of the lamb where the Lord is slain and yet lives. Now this can seem confusing in terms of a physical way. We're saying at the center of all things is the altar and at the center of all things is the throne. God is sitting upon the throne. Jesus is God. The Lamb is God. And so there is confusion here because in our brains we can't have two centers. But don't, don't fret too hard. We're, you know, we're not trying to have here something we can draw it with a sketch pad. At the center is the throne. Also at the center is the Lord Jesus, slain and yet living. And we're not talking about somebody with little minor holes. You get the idea that this is a lamb who has been stabbed through and is bloody and dead and yet stands up and goes, hey, how you doing? So we're not talking here about just some kind of sanitized notion of this gathering in heaven. This is something that is deeply visceral, deeply physical. The seven eyes remind us that he is all-knowing. The seven horns remind us that he is all-powerful. And then, too, we have the idea that the seven spirits are sent out, which is really a confusing way of saying it. It's probably a better way to think about it, as seven is a number of completeness or wholeness, and that seven spirits really are the Holy Spirit of God. There's some, some disagreement, and I'm not a, enough of an expert to get into the Greek with you, but, but suffice it to say, what we see here is an image of the Trinity, the, crown, or the, the, the throne, the altar, the seven spirits of God. Now, the Lamb is the only one, and we're moving ahead a little bit in chapter 5, the Lamb is the only one who is able to open the sealed scrolls. Now we're going to get into chapter 6 a little bit here too, uh, but I'm, I'm just going to hop a little bit because it would really we'd be here all day if I tried to read the entire first half of the book of Revelation. But we're jumping a little bit in chapter 6, and now we see that the Lamb is the only one who can open the sealed scroll. Now this scroll is the record of God's will which we learn about in Revelation chapter 10, verse 8. It's sealed because it's only made known to God, and only God can unseal it and make it known. So we're not talking about God here has put secret knowledge out there, and he is only allowing some people to know it. We're saying that this is a symbol of God's will, and until God does something, until he wills it, it cannot be known by us. We can't know the mind of God until God acts. You might look at me if you know me, and you may predict what I'm going to do. And you may predict rightly. You may say, Father Ryan's going to do this or do that, or he's going to say this, or he, he's got this sermon in mind just by my disposition. But we cannot know the will of God until the will of God comes forth. Now, there's philosophy there about the will of God and potentiality of the will of God. And is it possible for God to know something and not will it? And people would argue it's not. And there's this whole complicated, wonderful philosophical thing that flows from this. But what we get here out of chapters 5 and 6 in particular is the reality that God is the great supreme actor. He is the one who is at the center of heaven. All things that occur there occur because he wills them to be. <clears throat> and that includes things that we think should be wiped away. Like Jesus died and he rose from the dead, and that after he rose from the dead, we should have this sanitized notion of kind of warm and happy Jesus, who we see at Sunday school. And he's walking around and he's patting the little kids, and he's got the lamb and he's patting the lamb but we don't get that. We get this visceral notion that what God has willed was unnecessary and important and good and holy, and it lives forever. The lamb who was slain and yet lives. 
Now, we also have a number of subtleties in the text that I want to point out, and this is going to be chapters 5 and 6. Let's start with chapter 5. Uh, there's a number of subtleties. Uh, I want you to notice that the worship of God is a ritual sort of worship. Uh, and so we see this with the prayers of the saints in Revelation 5, 8. Uh, we see it symbolized by the ritual offering of incense. We see it symbolized by the worship of the Lamb uh, on the altar. We have the idea here that the worship is not something that's just whatever I want it to be. It's not praise and worship. It's not singing a song or a hymn, just whatever I want it to be. Nor is it something that is intimate or raw or my own expression, nor is it something spontaneous. What we see here is a worship that is very, very ritualized. And despite the fact the book of Revelation has all sorts of things that deviate from the Jewish sentiment and the Jewish way of thinking, this is something that feels incredibly deliberate. We have a very close connection to the Jewish understanding of worship that we see in the book of Revelation, and yet on the altar is not merely a sacrifice that's meant to have its blood sprinkled onto the altar. Now we have the Lamb Himself standing on the altar and, and basically functioning as judge, as king, as ruler from the altar. And so this is something that we have to remember. The idea that my worship should be my worship, the idea that I can come to the Lord however I want to come to the Lord, that's foreign to the scripture. It's foreign to Christianity. The idea that if I just sing a song and it makes me feel good, that's enough is utterly foreign to Christianity. That's not worship. And I'm somebody who loves the charismatic renewal, but that's not worship. Worship in the book of Revelation is a ritual act. And we're going to see it again and again when it comes to the, the, the elders who throw down their crown, when it comes to the angels, when it comes to the 144,000, when it comes to the uncountable number of the saved. We're going to see over and over again a ritual chanting or a ritual offering of worship and prayer. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next time. Uh, now, we also should know something about the process of getting ready for heaven. Uh, it's been in vogue for a good long while to say now uh, that I don't need organized religion to get into heaven. All I need to do is have a personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, and Catholics sometimes will catch flack for wearing crucifixes instead of a plain, plain cross. Um, or Catholics too will complain about the Mass being not something I can feel connected enough to. It's one of the great frustrations for, my, for me as a priest when, when I, I say to somebody, I say, you know, I, 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 this, it's better to offer Mass facing the altar than it is to offer Mass facing the congregation. And the response is, I like it better this way. And I just can't think of a worse thing to say when, when someone is arguing that it pleases God more to do things one way, and my response to that is, I prefer it my own way. Gosh, that's a terrible answer. And so it becomes something that we really have to think about and dig into because the book of Revelation is very much about the fact that God is at the center and not us. Um, and we have to kind of ask ourselves, if, if this is what heaven looks like, if this is what heaven is revealed as, it's, it's basically revealed as a service of worship, what we might call a mass, it's, it's revealed that that's what heaven will be. And so we prepare ourselves for heaven by kind of aligning our worship as much as possible with precisely what the book of Revelation tells us heaven is like. And so our worship really should be oriented toward the lamb on the altar, not toward the crowd behind who are supposed to be oriented toward the altar and not oriented toward themselves. And so we have kind of an interesting moment there that plays out further, but I don't, I don't want to say that we should take some random sentence from the book of Revelation and say this therefore argues in favor of a praxis or of a way of doing things. There is an argument to be made, and I'm not making these statements flippantly, there's a quite a bit more thinking. 
but we do want to be cautious, and I, you know, I should kind of slap myself on the, on the wrist a little bit for it. We don't want to say, I see something in the Bible, therefore that's the way I should do it in real life. So a little slap on the wrist for Father Ryan for jumping ahead of himself. Next time, though, I am going to talk a little bit more about that. Let's move ahead uh, a little bit. Uh, we're going to come back to the seven seals, I promise. But I want to jump ahead a little bit to the woman who is clothed with the sun, because we see the first kind of hint of her showing up here in chapter 5, but then we're going to see a more extensive version of her in chapter 12. And so we see uh, the woman who's clothed, and y'all, I wish we could spend so much more time on this, Um, but we see her described in ways that could represent, obviously, the Blessed Virgin Mary, but that's not all the woman clothed with the sun represents. And the reason I want to jump ahead here is because we see all these different images in chapter 5 and 6. We have the lamb, we have the elders, we have the four living creatures, we have the angels, we have the 144,000, we have the witnesses and so on and so forth. And and I want you to read chapters 5 and 6 to kind of get how that plays out. But as we have these people kind of gathered around the altar, we have the woman clothed with the sun making some some appearances here and there, and then she shows up for real kind of in her own chapter. And while we are tempted to say, that's Mary, that's the mother of Jesus, and in fact, that is what that moment symbolizes, she is also meant to represent for us Israel. And she's also meant to represent for us the Ark of the Covenant and the Temple. She's also meant to represent for us the the church herself. Remember that this woman is destined to fight the dragon, which is Satan. This woman is going to be attacked over and over again, and yet when it really matters, Christ is within her, and he will come out, and he will do battle against the dragons, and defeat them. And so what we have here in the woman clothed with the sun is not just an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, but we have the entire Israel, the entire kind of not the nation of Israel, but the the people of Israel, the chosen people. And we also have the church. And that helps to round out the story because what this does is it puts this image near to the altar And then we have all this kind of of end-of-the-world stuff that we're about to get into. And then the bookend of that is to say, hey, we also have this here, which is operating in a sort of different way of thinking. This is one image. This is a secondary image. But the woman clothed with the sun is in many ways an image of the whole court of heaven. And that's why we talk about as Catholics with as Mary being coronated as the queen of heaven because she becomes a kind of type of the way that we're supposed to think about all of the church and all of heaven. And so there's a lot of really complicated moving pieces here that, again, there are some great books that you'd want to read if this piques your interest. So don't, don't feel like you're being shortchanged. Uh, also, I want to look, j- jump ahead a little bit quickly to, to Revelation chapter 19, where the entirety of heaven is described as a wedding feast. Now, the wedding feast imagery, combined with the imagery of the rainbow at the beginning, combined with the imagery of the eating of the scroll, which we show up, uh, will show up a bit in chapter 6, uh, that is, and the eating of that scroll was the will of God and the teaching of Jesus and the Gospels, um, but combined with, with the idea of the wedding feast, with heaven, with the image of that, and then with the idea, too, um, the, of the teaching of Jesus in the gospel, that there will be no marriage in heaven. It just won't happen. Creates this reminder, and this is the third major image of heaven, from the heavenly court to the woman clothed with the sun, and now to chapter 19, the wedding feast. We get the idea that wedding, the wedding feast is not to celebrate uh, a wedding per se, but it's to symbolize the intimacy that heaven will be for us. This incredible closeness, this spiritual and in some cases physical intimacy that heaven is meant to be. It is not meant to be me going and chatting with somebody or finding out those things I always wanted to know about the world, nor is it meant to be me to indulge in all the pie I can eat, but there's this incredible sense of intimacy. So we have these three images of heaven each of which is meant to point us to a deeper understanding of heaven in our own way and to a deeper understanding of what we might call divine intimacy. 
Okay, so how then do we get to heaven? How do we go about obtaining heaven? And we're, I want to tie up heaven and get to hell and then get us to uh, where a lot of us folks want to be, which is the end of the world. Um, so how do we get to heaven? Well, ultimately, it's straightforward. It's prayer, it's penance, um, which we see now is good and necessary for the Christian life. Um, it's also uh, works of mercy, and it is the ritual worship that is due to God and which is maintained in the Catholic sacraments. And so we have what amounts to prayer, fasting, works of mercy, and the Mass. That's how we get to heaven. That's the nature of the way that God has given us. And in fact, that's what we see as we read through the book of Revelation where we talk about prayer, both spontaneous and, and, and ritualized prayer. We have fasting, penance, and the, and the works of the, of, of the ascetical life, as we call them. And then we have works of mercy. These things are seen as important. And if we hop back to the, the Gospels, we see Jesus talking about how judgment is tied to the works of mercy. If you see someone who is, is hungry and give them food, did you see someone thirsty and give them drink? We have penance being tied to any number of teachings of Jesus. And then, of course, prayer being one we can see everywhere. And then this idea of the ritual worship being the entire first image of what heaven is. This idea of the lamb at the center, also the God on the throne at the center, and then all of us wrapped around in various degrees of nearness to the, the divine heart of the most holy trinity. And so that's how we get to heaven. Now, what does the word, te- wh- wh- rather, uh, what does the church teach about these things? Well, precisely that. Uh, we're, we're not just kind of grabbing these things out of thin air. These are pretty clear in the book of Revelation, but the church teaches that, that this comes from there, and it also comes from the, 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 uh, the Gospels. Okay. Now, I know I spoke rather quickly. That's been a good 25 or 30 minutes on heaven. Uh, And so if you need to take a break, now's a good time to pause the video and take a break because we're going to come back and we're going to hit hell and we're going to go into the end of days. So now, coming back, if we know all this about heaven, what then do we know about hell? Well, fortunately, we need a lot less energy to understand what hell is and why it is. Um, Hell is ultimately simply separation from heaven. That's it. I mean, that's what hell boils down to. There there could be all kinds of suffering. There could be a red guy and a pitchfork. Uh, There could be any number of things in hell. But at the end of the day, the most essential part is separation. And this is why the physicality matters so much. This is why that physical reality of heaven and hell is such a thing. And so because there is this supra-physicality in heaven, we are body and soul, uh, heaven then has all sorts of these specific characteristics. Worship the lamb who was slain. But hell, exactly the same way, but in opposite. Because of physicality, we could be tortured all day long, but the real suffering of hell is separation from nearness to God. Um, We see in the book of Revelation uh, that any kind of of suffering um, can be redeemed by the lamb, but any suffering that is not redeemed by the lamb will be amplified and worsened in heaven. We have the image of the lake of fire. We have the image of of Satan and his torturers. We have the idea that hell, ultimately, though, is just the separation from God and that it keeps us from being near to God and therefore we have all of the aspects of, of our suffering that we might associate in this modern day psychology world with depression or mania or even something like schizophrenia, where we feel separated and isolated from others, that would be the real suffering of hell. Physical tortures, good, bad, in between, might accompany it, they might not, but at the end of the day, that's what hell boils down to. And when we really stop and think about it, the horror of that is almost too much to bear. You know, I mean, even people here, you feel like if, if, I'm, if I'm truly depressed, there might be a way out. It's not really a way out, and it's, it's, if you feel that way, you should definitely reach out for some help, because it's not a solution in any way, shape, or form, but at least we feel like there might be something here. In hell, there is no possibility of that. 
In hell there is total and complete isolation and separation. C.S. Lewis wrote one of the most wonderful books with one of the worst titles that I've ever read. And I've read it maybe eight times now. It's called The Great Divorce. And it is a book about heaven and hell. And it is not a book about marriage and divorce. But in, in that book, he describes purgatory and hell uh, as a place that basically is like a, gr a giant gray city. And in that giant gray city, you can build anything you want just by an act of the mind. But because everyone gets fed up with one another so quickly, they isolate themselves further and further and further away. And even though there is a clear access point to go to heaven, people don't want anything to do with it because it gets in the way of their own isolation. And they become more and more and more miserable the longer they are there in this place of what amounts to isolation. Now, that's not a theologically adept view, but it is incredibly, you know, evocative of the way that hell works. Now, let's turn away from the sadness of hell to the question that gets so many people in a tizzy. Knowing what we know about heaven, knowing what we know about hell, what can we say or come to understand from the book of Revelation, which is predominantly about heaven and about hell, what can we say about the end of the world? Well, let's look at chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, because this is going to be the starting point. Now, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, as with a voice of thunder, Come, and I saw and behold a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. We have this white horse and this rider who is given a, a bow, who is given a symbol of authority and of power and a crown. Now that rider is Christ. He is the redeemer. Based on what we say, we he, read rather in chapters 4 and 5, he is the only one who can conquer. And so now we've been given a couple different visions. We have the, the angels who are talking to the churches. We have this image in chapter 5, and a little bit in chapter 6 is going to bleed over, of what the, the heavenly court looks like. And now we have here in chapter 6 the idea that Christ is going to ride out and he's going to do battle. Now he's done that in a certain sense, walking backward in history, when he came into the world and he did battle against Satan in the desert and he did battle against the, the Jewish people, uh, the, the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin. He did battle against sin. He did battle against unbelievers. He did battle against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. He is the only one who's fit to conquer. Now, the details that follow, chapters 6 and 7, <coughs> the details that follow are all very interesting, but they don't generally have as much meaning as we might like to think they do. Uh, what about the Red Rider and war and discord? What about famine and poverty and the black rider? What about pestilence and plague and the green rider? What about the millions of martyrs whose blood cries out for vengeance at the opening of the fifth seal? What about the breakdown in the weather and the environment at the opening of the sixth seal? What about all the terrors we face? Ultimately, Christ is the one who conquers those. And, and really, we can try to write as much symbolism as we want into those things, but they're not meant to be some deeply, profoundly symbolic reality. These are simply things that exist. War and pestilence and famine and, and earthquake and flood and tornado. These are things that, are, that, that come to us that destroy our calm, that we believe separate us from Christ, and which in fact do not separate us from Christ. And so there's not a need to spend an hour and a half talking about what the green rider is or the red rider. And remember, these guys don't symbolize Napoleon or Joel Olstein or, you know, Donald Duck. I mean, these things are not some kind of hidden secret message. These are simply the things that we experience in life that we believe separate us from God, but which really don't. And certainly, each of those circumstances and those sufferings are incredibly important to the ones of us who suffer from them. 
I know I, I lived through Hurricane Katrina. I know I lived through some difficult moments personally, some difficult moments emotionally, whatever the case might be. And those things are very important to me. But the question ultimately becomes, does it separate me from the love of God or not? And in, in all honesty, that becomes something that reminds us that the book of Revelation is not just for the world, it is also for me. Now, the same image comes to mind um, when we start thinking about the seven trumpets in chapters 8 and 9. The incense is lit. I talked about that a little earlier. The prayers of the saints rise to heaven. I talked about that a little earlier. And for all the horrors of the earth, those who have found their place in heaven are unmoved. Now it's important to get a little bit of the structure in mind. We talked about chapter 4 where we really started to get a sense of, um, of the way that heaven looks. Then chapter 5 and chapter 6 were kind of uh, tied in with some pestilence and some difficulties. Our chapter 5, 6, and 7 were tied in with pestilence and difficulties. Then we come back to the heavenly court again. And chapters 8 and 9 take us back to that same court we were in before. And they remind us that the Lamb is still on the altar, and now this heavenly court is unaffected by all of this trial and difficulty, because nothing separates us from the love of God except, well, me, ultimately. Now, we could obsess about what it might be like. We can obsess all day long about what happens if the rivers turn to blood. What happens if there is an earthquake? What if there are three earthquakes? Is that enough? What about a coronavirus? Is that kind of symbolized by the locust or the hornet or whatever? At the end of the day, the answer is no. The reality is the book of Revelation here is trying to reveal to us that all kinds of bad stuff will happen. It'll happen to me personally. It'll happen to the world. And no matter what happens, I should bring myself as much as possible in spirit back to this heavenly court. I see the heavenly court. I open up the, or the, the seven seals are opened. And what happens? Trial, difficulty, you know, difficulties and trials and whatever. What should I do? I should go back to that court. I should try to put myself among those who are singing and praising God in chapters 8 and 9. Then we're going to see another dose. We've got, tr we've got uh, trumpets and more horrors and more difficulties. But none of these things have the power in and of themselves to damage us. Why? Because death has lost its sting. And so it, 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 while some people will spend thousands of pages trying to explain all the detail, and even though I teased at this the very first night, or very first uh, talk when I talked about this whole idea of the locust with the, 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 uh, the stinger of, uh, of the um, scorpion and the blonde hair and all that kind of stuff, and what does that symbolize? End of the day, it doesn't matter what it symbolizes. Now, yes, there are some very specific things attached to the first community of John, who, who, where he was bishop of all of what is now Turkey, and he was talking, yes, about a certain race of people who might have been particularly dangerous. And yes, the idea of the stinger being attached to locusts who came in these massive numbers would have been, the, the idea was there's going to be a huge number of people who will come and they will be dangerous and so on and so forth, and that the ordinary people will become armed and there will be pestilence and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, those things just don't matter beyond being trivia. And while it seems like they do, it really doesn't because death has lost its sting. You see, we're trying to do the sting. And so we have this kind of mentality where we have to get out of ourselves the idea that I need this kind of sensationalism because y'all at best that is detrimental to our spiritual lives. And at worst, it brings us off to the place of something in complete lunacy, like a rapture. The idea of a rapture, which depending on version, which version you're discussing, includes some combination of a mass removal of people from the earth, uh, a period of great tribulation, and a final conquering of the world by the Lord. It seems to miss entirely what the book of Revelation is trying to do. There is this small section that's trying to give John a sense of what's going to happen, but most of what the book of Revelation is trying to do is to constantly bounce off or constantly contrabalance. Here is the Lord saying, get your act together. Here's a picture of heaven, a little teaser of hell. Then another thing saying, the Lord saying, look, if bad stuff comes, return to heaven. If bad stuff comes, return to heaven. Reorient yourself. 
and think about the fact that God is going to conquer. Jesus is Lord of all things. And so we have the structure of the book itself saying, tough warning, heaven. Difficult times, heaven. Trials and tribulations, the woman clothed with the sun will conquer the dragon. A little bit more trial and tribulation, and then we come back to 19, chapter 19 through 22, which is all about the wedding feast of the Lamb and the idea that Jesus has conquered and is at victory. And so when we get off our thinking into something ridiculous like the rapture, we find ourselves totally missing the point and in many ways inventing something which distracts us from what the book is actually about. From this incredible reminder that Christ has conquered all things. Remember when John wrote this book. John wrote this book. He had, he had been the, the uh, bishop of Asia Minor, what is now Turkey. And he had been the bishop of this whole region for a long time. And he was an old man. And an emperor, uh, Dionysius, no, no, uh, Decius, I believe Decius, one of the emperors, the Roman emperors at this point, there was the Tetrarchy, he arrested him and brought him to Rome in chains. So John is the last living apostle. He comes to Rome in chains. They set up a big pot of boiling oil outside the Latin gate in front of where St. John Lateran is now. And, and they put this giant pot of oil just outside the city gates and they boil the oil and they throw the old man in it. Now this is going to be like throwing a turkey leg, you know, or throwing a donut and boiling oil. And it's supposed to be horrifying. What happens to John? He sits in it like a hot tub. You know, I mean, you get the idea of him waiting for the ordering of a mimosa or something. He's sitting in this thing and for hours they're throwing fire, wood on the fire trying to kill him. No luck, no joy, he just won't die. So finally, the, the centurions go and tell the emperor, who is furious, but he says, listen, if I can't kill you, I'm exiling you, so get out. And he sends him to Patmos, where he himself personally, obviously, is trusting in the Lord and yet feels overwhelmed, and where his people in Asia Minor, what is now Turkey, this whole huge swath of people, are looking and saying our bishop was taken and this horrible things happened. What do we do? And so it is that John receives this incredible vision, which is a wonderful balance of, look, bad stuff's going to happen. Jesus has conquered. Bad stuff's going to happen. Jesus has conquered. The modern notion of a rapture does not exist in the Bible. It does not exist in good theology. It is at best, as I said, a detriment and a confusion. There are moments where someone is taken up body and soul. Jesus, uh, or rather I should say Enoch and Elijah in the Old Testament, uh, Jesus rises on his own. The Blessed Virgin Mary is taken up into heaven. We have a few instances in the scripture, but that's not the ordinary path. And I already talked a little bit about how we can misread and misunderstand. But I mean, if we, if we were to flip open Matthew's gospel and we say, oh, look, it says right there, there'll be one that will be taken, one that will be left, one that will be taken, one that will be left. We could read that as some kind of secret hidden knowledge. Or we could look in the larger sense and say, that's the Lord talking about going to heaven, being saved or not. You know, that, and that's really what that boils down to. We don't need to get overly caught up in all the details because there's exactly six million versions of the rapture, which should be a good indicator to say that it is not something which is evidently scriptural. If there's so many different people who've had to invent so many different ways to interpret it and confuse it. And even the passages in Revelation that point back to the reality that heaven is beyond the concerns of the earth, and if we die from tribulations, that our blood would then be uh, martyrs and we would be saved. I mean, the idea here being that, that at the absolute heart of what we're talking about here is that even those who suffer the worst and are martyred will find themselves in that heavenly court. It's not about those who can manage to short-circuit uh, short that and who can manage to be, be taken up into heaven while they're working at the wheat mill or while they're working at the Tesla plant. That's not, that's not what the Lord is trying to get at. The good news for us is that the Lord has made provision for us and that He has destroyed death and conquered its sting. And so the end of the world will be a terrible thing. It will be horrific and horrifying for those who are there. It will be uh, absolutely flooded 
with all sorts of trials and tribulations, but the fact that there are trials and tribulations in our world has nothing at all to do with what the end of days will be like. Nothing at all to do with what the end of days will be like. Now, I am recording this on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, and I have 10 minutes until I am at one hour uh, for this presentation. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes kind of taking a moment to walk us through, and I've, I've done this on COVID Catechism before, but to walk us through a little bit of what Our Lady of Fatima has to say about eternity. And this is extremely important. I think it's very, very valuable for us to remember because it, it all fits very nicely with what we understand about the book of Revelation, and it debunks entirely rapture thinking or the left behind sort of thinking. Now, you remember the story of Our Lady of Fatima? Just very briefly, an angel appears to three young children who are Portuguese in the middle of nowhere and says to them, listen, um, the, uh, Our Lady is going to appear to you. She's going to show up and she's going to talk to you. They say, okay, sure, why not? Uh, they don't know if it's, it's the real deal or not. One of these kids is six. One of them is nine. I mean, these are young kids. So it turns out Our Lady does appear to them beginning on May the 13th, 1917. She appears to them for five consecutive months, and on October the 13th, 1917, there is the great miracle of the sun witnessed by 90,000 people. She, during her visits with the children, gives them a vision of hell. She talks to them about the need to offer up their sacrifices, to pray the rosary, and she warns them that the Lord is going to do worse things if the Catholic Church doesn't get its act together. This happens right at the end of World War I. Of course, we know our history. World War II comes in right on schedule. There are all sorts of shocking coincidences that happen, including astronomical phenomenon, including the fact that Pope Pius XII, uh, a pope of some very questionable choices and some, some really wacky stuff with his pontificate. He is made a bishop at the same time the miracle of the sun is happening. Um, Our Lady gives three secrets to the children. Uh, one of those secrets was meant to be released at a very specific time in 1960. It wasn't. Right after it wasn't released, there is a series of new apparitions of Our Lady saying things that are tough to hear, uh, going through a place called Garabandal in Spain, then ultimately in Akita in Japan. Uh, and then we, we have this moment associated with the 100th anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima, where right on time, when, Our Lady, when the 100th anniversary of Our Lady of Fatima comes around, we have all sorts of crazy stuff going on, uh, wherein uh, you know, certain people are being unmasked, and there is kind of this unbinding uh, that is associated with all sorts of, of different kind of prophetic things that we hear going back to popes, going back to bishops, going back to other apparitions of Our Lady in Quito, Ecuador, and so on and so forth. So huge amounts of things that are associated with Our Lady of Fatima. But the great message that she has, all of these things, all these messages about what could be, what will be, prophesying various kinds of things, telling us a little bit about the future, just a little bit, all of which of course has come true exactly as she said, what we find is two great statements we find, one, the statement that Christ is the victor. And the other, we find, is that the Lord promises that before the end comes, there will be a triumph, quote-unquote, of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. What an unbelievable and unexpected moment that our Lord will bring about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We don't know exactly what that means. We don't have any reticular history to work from, but it does start to make sense if we look at the book of Revelation that we have the triumph of the Lamb who was slain and yet lives, and then we have the, the uh, image of the woman clothed with the sun as the second great image of heaven in the book of Revelation. And then the third, of course, is the great wedding feast, the consummation. And so it starts to make sense that if our Lord did want to use the book of Revelation as a broad outline for history, then it is possible to think about this kind of the first phase being the victory of Christ over the devil, the second phase being the victory of the woman over the devil, and then the third phase being the consummation. So is the, the, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart imminent? We don't know. We have no sense whatsoever. It could be tomorrow, it could be a thousand years, just like the end of days. But I'll tell you this, I do not believe the world is coming to an end anytime soon. 
I do not believe that our Lord is simply going to snap his fingers and it's all going to end right here tomorrow. It could, but I don't believe that's going to happen because I'm waiting for the Immaculate Heart to triumph and Our Lady made some very specific promises that we are waiting to see fulfilled. And so, y'all, this is not a moment to be panicky. It's not a time to say, how can I predict that the future is coming or there's some dark moment ahead? This is a genuine moment of privilege. The Lord is giving us a chance to be part of a trial and a tribulation and a suffering. And as miserable as that might seem, it is in in fact an incredible gift. It is an incredible gift. It may be difficult, but it is an incredible gift. And so what do we learn about the book of Revelation thus far before we jump into part four? We learned that the angels have the same basic message to the cities. Don't worship idols. Don't lose yourselves. Always keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Then we turn to chapters five and six, and we see the image of heaven, which is very much attached to a lamb at the center with the the throne of God. We see kind of a hierarchical structure surrounding that. We see ritual worship with the offering of incense and specific chants. We see that this kind of back and forth between there will be bad things, Jesus conquers. There will be trials and tribulations, Jesus conquers. We see the image of the woman clothed with the sun. Again, her, she gives birth to the child who conquers. Then we see the consummation of all things in heaven in chapter 19 and 22. And so we have this book which is really about heaven. It's about the consolations of heaven. We see a little bit about hell. We see a little bit about trials and difficulties. We see a little bit about the end of days, none of which, though, are meant to do anything other than to be a reminder that Jesus is Lord. Next time, because we are now uh, right at the very end of my talk, next time we will talk about about what it means to this whole idea of this ritual worship of the Lamb. What does that mean? How does it show up in heaven? What's the story associated with it? How does that affect our understanding of worship? How does that affect our understanding of mass? Because it turns out that the mass and the book of Revelation are very, very connected and that they are not, you know, really, uh, you know, kind of two separate things. But in a very real way, the mass is the living out of the book of Revelation. And so that will be the fourth part in this series, which will hopefully happen more promptly than this one. I do have to apologize. There were some issues trying to get this recorded, but I'm very, very happy to have gotten it finished for you. And so uh, that is the end of part three. And I will look forward to seeing you for part four of the book of Revelation here on the CU COVID Catechism. God bless you.